I saw the city in the deep, deep distance that was dark green and all these lights flickering and clouds flowing over it. And this all started after tremendous geometric patterns that are incredibly rapid that you cannot describe to anybody. They're so fast. After those had slowed down, I saw this city in the deep distance. Um, so I was sort of watching that, and then this ball of light goes right past me, right in front of me, like, what was that? It didn't scare me, except it was so close. After that, I started looking around. It's like you're in this place, and you're going, well, why am I in this place? And then I noticed that there was this woman off to my right with a uh, real long nose. She had green skin. She was turning this dial, and I realized she was turning the volume of lights up and down on the city in the distance. And as soon as I looked at her, she noticed I was watching her. And she said, so what else do you want? I said, uh, what else do you have? This is the story of DMT, or dimethyltryptamine, a simple compound found throughout nature which has profound effects on human consciousness. One of the things, besides what it does, one of the things about DMT that, uh, that always fascinated me was the fact that it's such a simple molecule. It biosynthetically, it's two steps from tryptophan right, uh, two trivial enzymatic steps from tryptophan. Well, tryptophan is an amino acid, of course, and it's everywhere. So all organisms have tryptophan, and all organisms have the two key enzymes that lead to the synthesis of DMT. And these enzymes are very ancient enzymes. They're all over the place. They're, again, part of basic metabolism. So theoretically, anything could synthesize DMT. DMT is uh, astonishingly widely available in plants and animals all, all around the world, but so far nobody really knows why it's there or what its, or what its function is. That's the $64 billion question, <laughs> is why is DMT in our bodies? Why is it in plants and all sorts of mammals? What is the role it plays in humans? The conventional wisdom 30, 40 years ago was that these things had no real function. They were just sort of physiological noise. But that's a very naive understanding. And what we now understand is that these secondary compounds are, in a sense, the language of plants. These are messenger molecules. This is what plants use to mediate their relationships with other organisms in the environment. Why is it that human beings' central nervous system are wired to receive this experience? Must be that, uh, you know, there, there's important information to be learned. So I don't think it's universally present in nature by accident. It has a real function. We have co-evolved with these plants. There's a purpose and a, and a meaning to it. So it really fits in with the notion that DMT may be the common molecular language, resonant language, among all living beings on this planet and maybe others as well. I can't think of a more powerful tool to explore the whole question of what is consciousness. These substances are tools that can be used to expand awareness in all areas of life and apply that expanded awareness in, uh, for the betterment of people's lives and their communities, their families, and our society. The good news is that there's a growing number of Westerners and, and actually intellectual scientists, artists, movers and shakers, filmmakers and so on who realize that uh, this stuff is all too interesting just to go on uh, keeping it swept under the rug.
with the help of two concepts that are traditionally opposed, science and spirituality, we humbly reintroduce psychedelics back into the cultural dialogue. DMT, the spirit molecule, you know, it's a conundrum, it's a paradox. What uh, the spirit is the inner world. Uh, the molecule is the external world. So the psychedelics or entheogens uh, take us from the science to the spirit. This hypothesis proposes that the pineal gland at certain times when it's under a specific uh, stress or stimulation, it releases a significant amount of this uh, hormone, DMT, and it's that hormone that facilitates the entering and exiting of the soul in the body. This is what the Jewish sage mystics have been describing in a coded language for literally thousands of years. Through meditation, through fasting, chanting, any number of techniques, uh, there might be um, a burst of endogenous DMT that was correlated with mystical and near-death experiences. And I had this theory that um, there was a big similarity between psychedelics and uh, experiences that were possible with a lot of meditation. Um, and that was one of the original findings uh, that led me to start looking for a spirit molecule, for a, a, a compound in the brain that uh, elicited mystical experience. I think there may be a role for DMT in explaining any number of hallucinatory phenomena you know, that man has experienced you know, throughout his history. Creativity, imagination, dream states, changes that occur due to isolation, trauma, starvation, uh, all of which produce hallucinatory phenomena. These hallucinatory phenomena are explainable uh, by the presence of compounds known to produce hallucinations. And the only compounds that we know of that are capable of doing this are the class of compounds known as hallucinogens. There's something that, for me, makes sense about DMT. You called it the spirit molecule. It might almost be called, you know, the reality molecule. Philosophically, it makes sense that something that would be so fundamental to um, the way we perceive reality would be imbued out there in reality. There was a sense around it that there was something special, that, that it wasn't uh, like anything else. There wasn't like other uh, psychedelics. Its intensity and speed was such that it really produced a different kind of uh, response. I mean, I remember almost getting the sense that it was kind of like a, like a psychedelic bungee jump, that there was a kind of raw leap into this rapidly changing environment that was very different than the more gradual approaches uh, of other psychedelics. And smoke DMT is sort of like the drive-by shooting of psychedelics. <laughs> you're in one place, bang, you're in another place, and then bang, you're back down. So it doesn't leave a whole lot of room for that narrative of who am I, what am I doing here, why am I in this space, what am I learning? It's almost like there was too much information to process in that few minute span to integrate once you drop back down. Dimethyltryptamine, when it's administered, has a very rapid onset and a very short duration of action. This is because it's very rapidly broken down by the body so that it can be cleared. DMT is rapidly degraded by an enzyme in the liver called monoamine oxidase, or MAO. That's the reason it's not active when you take it by mouth. Whereas psilocybin, when you take it by mouth, it's not broken down by monoamine oxidase very quickly at all. So it, it gets through the liver and passes on into the bloodstream and into the brain. The DMT flash makes it clear that uh, disembodied consciousness is a possibility. I think that the whole tension of history and the tension of life 
seems to be about the shedding of the body. Terence was uh, very, he was a good promoter. Basically, he said it's, it's the ultimate metaphysical reality pill, and even though it's not a pill, but uh, I thought that was a pretty good characterization after I took it. It seemed to be uh, of a different order than LSD and mescaline and some of the other things that were around. DMT really did seem to be a, uh, a whole other level of experience. I ask that you suspend any opinions, either negative or positive, about these compounds. Whatever you believe their value to be, they continue to have profound effects wherever we find their use, whether it's contemporary Western culture or in the Amazon rainforest. It was in the 50s that the ayahuasca churches started come, going public. You know, that from there was a kind of a transition from the in, indigenous Indians in South America to, to the mestizo people in the cities, and then these churches, you know, the Santo Daime Church, and then the UDV Church, a little later, started doing ceremonies that would made the ayahuasca accessible not just to Indians, but to urban people in the big cities in Brazil, who are as far from the shamans as we are. In the early 1990s, the UDV established a branch uh, of their church in the United States. In the late 90s, um, the, the U.S. Uh, Customs Department, along with the DEA, intercepted a shipment of ayahuasca. The church um, uh, protested the government action. They contended that it violated the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, and the case was heard in the U.S. Supreme Court. And in February 2006, their decision was announced, and it was a unanimous decision uh, on the side of the UDV. How did these cultures that consider themselves to be enlightened, democratic, and scientific get to declaring plants illegal? It can seem weird, but there's clearly something deep and revealing about the nature of these societies. Our society values alert problem-solving consciousness, and it devalues all other states of consciousness. Any kind of consciousness that is not related to the production or consumption of material goods is stigmatized in our society today. Of course, we accept drunkenness. We allow people some brief respite from the material grind. A society that subscribes to that model is a society that is going to condemn states of consciousness that have nothing to do with the alert problem-solving mentality. And if you go back to the 1960s, when there was you know, a tremendous upsurge of exploration of psychedelics, I would say that the huge backlash that, that followed that had to do with a fear on the part of the powers that be. That... We are now, whether we like it or not, in the psychochemical age. In the future, it's not going to be what book you read, it's going to be what chemicals do you use to open or close your consciousness. Chemicals can help us learn faster. Chemicals can help us expand or contract our consciousness. How does one go about studying these plants and compounds? Plants and compounds which produce unimaginable experiences and appear to shed light on some of humanity's greatest mysteries. In order to answer that question, Dr. Strassman conducted the first human psychedelic research in a generation. Once we actually got into the preparation for the actual trips, Rick asked me uh, about roller coasters. Do you like roller coasters? You know, the sensation of going up really high and then slamming back down towards Earth. Set and setting is so important. It's even more important than the substance. Then there'd be a hum, and the hum would get louder and louder, and to the point where it broke apart everything that I was or knew. It was just this. Mm -hmm. 